All right. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. I am your host, Toby Passman. On the show today, I have a very special guest, Dr. Jerry Pollack. Um, Dr. Pollack is a scientist recognized worldwide as a a dynamic speaker and author whose passion lies in plumbing the depths of uh, natural truths. He received the first Emoto Peace Prize and is a recipient of the University of Washington's highest honor, the Annual Faculty Lecturer Award. He is founding editor-in-chief of the research journal Water and director of the Institute for Venture Science. Dr. Pollack's award-winning books include The Fourth Phase of Water and Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. Dr. Pollack, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Oh, my pleasure, Toby. Good to be with you. Um, Happy to be here. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, what would be interesting to start off with is, you know, you've kind of based uh, a lot of your research on something called easy water. Um, And if you could just kind of break that down um, for the listener, if people haven't heard of that, what is easy water and and why should we care about it? Well, okay, I'll address the second question before the first one. You should care about it because it's the kind of water that fills your body. And, um, uh, And since it fills your body and participates in virtually everything that your cells do inside your body, you should be curious about it, or at least... Um, at least be uh, uh, learn something about this. So what is easy water? Well, easy um, stands for exclusion zone. And uh, we coined the term easy. It was a suggestion from, an, from a colleague in Australia uh, because it's easy to remember. But it stands, actually, it's, it doesn't work in Europe because it's in Europe, it's EZ, not EZ, and in most other countries too. So, so the, the um, advantage in, in the term EZ is conferred pretty much exclusively to Americans who use the term Z instead of Z, so easy to remember. So it stands for exclusion zone, and what do we mean by exclusion zone? When we first discovered this water uh, some years ago, we discovered it because it was a zone in water that actually excludes particles and solutes. You know, usually if you put some stuff in water, it spreads all over the place. And we noticed under certain conditions that there was a region of water um, uh, that tended to exclude, especially these tiny little particles called microspheres, uh, that is little spheres. This is uh, uh, commonly used in scientific research, and uh, and at first uh, we 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 took a, a gel uh, made of water, a hydrogel, not not so different from jello, something like that, but but it wasn't it wasn't that. It was polyvinyl alcohol gel, and we put it next. To, we we put it in a chamber and dumped some water in it, and we put these little tiny spheres into the water. And we noticed that right next to the gel, um, uh, the the microspheres were excluded. And this zone uh, at which the microspheres were excluded kept growing over time. And it reached um, uh, typically a few hundred micrometers, that's maybe a third of a millimeter, uh, big enough that you could actually see it with your naked eye, but we used a, a microscope. And we called it the exclusion zone because that's the first property that we found. But um, after a few years, we we performed a lot more experiments and we found a lot more. And we found that this region that was next to the gel and and next to actually many other different substances that we tried later is different from ordinary water. So in ordinary water, the molecules are bouncing around at a huge number of times per second, and they're randomly uh, oriented. But in this kind of water, we found, the molecules are organized. The water molecules are, in a a way, kind of lined up, uh, ordered, structured. People have used different terms to to describe this. Um, and, and, And we studied it Um, And over the years, we found some pretty interesting characteristics. Um, The first characteristic, um, I already mentioned, it excludes substances profoundly. The second one is that unlike ordinary water, which is not charged, 
this is charge. It has a typically has a net negative charge, and the corresponding positive charge lies in the region beyond this uh, exclusion zone. So it's like a battery. You know, you got negative in one place and positive in another place. And if you if you were to connect these two areas uh, to a load of some sort, like a lamp or something, it'll light the lamp because it, it acts like an ordinary battery. And the second um, is you don't you don't get energy from nothing. The energy has first to be input, and then you get it out. So um, it's like a like the the battery that's inside your cell phone. I think I'm almost the only person on the face of the earth who doesn't own one <laughs> um, uh, for various reasons. But uh, but you can actually extract that electrical uh, energy. But yeah, so for your cell phone, it doesn't work unless you recharge the battery. And it's the same with this battery. It requires energy for recharging. And so where does this energy come from? It actually, we found, comes from light. And uh, we, we checked wavelengths of light, even beyond the visible spectrum. We, we started with ultraviolet, and then violet, blue, and throughout the spectrum, and then infrared. And we found that all of the um, wavelengths are somewhat effective, but far more effective than any of the visible or UV uh, wavelengths is infrared, particularly at a wavelength of three micrometers, which is actually the wavelength that water likes to absorb the most. So we found that the energy that water likes to absorb is then converted into a uh, buildup of the EZ. It makes it bigger. You put in more infrared light and the exclusion zone expands. Um, so it's a battery, you might say, and the battery is, is recharged uh, by infrared light. And the infrared is all around us. We, you know, many, many people are not so familiar with where infrared light comes from. I, I say infrared light, uh, people would call it infrared energy or, but they're, it's the same thing. And you know that it's coming from say a, a toaster or electric oven. You look and you feel the heat and you see the glowing coils and everybody knows that it's generating infrared energy. But in fact, in infrared energy is um, more prevalent than you, you, you might guess from, from what I, I've just said. It's all over the place. And, and you can document that yourself if you have an infrared camera. So if you, if you darken your room where you're sitting now, I see that, that the drapes are drawn. It's pretty dark inside mm -hmm. if you turn off the lights, I presume. You won't be able to see anything, and if you whip out your camera, your mobile phone camera, you won't be get be able to get an image. But if you had, if you had a camera whose sensor is sensitive uh, to infrared wavelengths, then you get a beautiful image. So it's used as um, it, these infrared cameras are are or, or um, they're 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 used uh, basically to see in the dark, and they're used a lot in military. Uh, applications. So, what and, about with uh, with infrared saunas? Is that one of the ways in which they work? Is by kind of building up easy water in the cells? Totally. Uh, you you hit it right on. Uh, it, it, at least that that's our hypothesis because you know you're so step one is um, that your cells are filled with with this kind of water with easy water, and, and step two is that. Uh, in many pathologies, uh, you don't have enough of this water inside your cell. So uh, if, you, if you don't have enough, you've got a pathology. Uh, your cells are not functioning well, and that could be manifested in any organ in your body. It could be a headache that you have, it could be you're feeling tired, it could be your muscle is aching, or just basically anything. And, and what you need to reverse that is a buildup of this kind of water, at least to reverse it temporarily, uh, and in, in some cases, perhaps over the long term. So you go into a sauna and 
and you feel the heat and that heat is basically infrared energy that's coming at you and um, if you're not wearing any clothing it, it will be absorbed everywhere in, in your body even through clothing some of the wavelengths will get through and so you walk into the sauna and you feel um, you're feeling miserable you've got a headache and i can remember <laughs> I, an instance in finland um, about five six years ago and I'd given a talk that day and in the evening was a party and the party was very nice with food and uh, goodwill and such and about a time by the time 10 p.m came i'd had it all i wanted to do is go back to my hotel and go to sleep and so finally uh, some guy stands up there with his microphone and uh, says and i thought for sure he's going to say well the buses are loading time to get on instead he didn't say that he said uh, okay, the saunas are now open. Uh, we have a we have a wet one, we have a dry one. Uh, there were three or four different ones that you could go to. And so I, everybody went, and I said, "Oh well, okay. Even though I'm dead to the world, I'll go." Well, twenty or thirty minutes later, it felt like I'd had eight hours sleep. It's the morning, and I can do just anything. <laughs> and I, the the difference between the two states of being was it was so dramatic I, I couldn't believe the difference and I, I also enjoyed some in Russia uh, they called it banya over there instead of sauna as they do in, in Finland but but the result is the same I think it's true for most people uh, most people go in and they feel better in one way or another um, when they come out and the reason um, it would be my hypothesis. I don't have proof of this, but uh, it follows from all the experiments we've done that when you're exposed to infrared energy, since infrared energy builds easy water, in your body, easy water is built. And especially in those cells where it's particularly deficient, you get more easy water. So that, that, works, uh, that works very well. So I think you put your finger on it. And I think that is the reason why uh, or at least one of the reasons for sure why saunas are really uh, good for health. And that's right. also why various people have their own um, uh, uh, infrared lamp, uh, infrared sauna, because it does the trick. Sure. So, yeah, thanks, thanks for mentioning that. That's yeah. Really and now that, now that we're just on the topic of light, I'm curious, does uh, the sun have an effect on easy water? Well, um, um, I, I think the answer is yes. I don't, um, I don't have direct proof of that, but you know, when you, when you think about, about the sun's, uh, the wavelengths that come from the sun, 50% of those wavelengths that, get, that reach the earth are in the infrared wavelength region, you know, beyond the visible light. So when you, when you walk into the sun, you feel light and you feel heat. Right, you sense light, you feel heat. And that heat comes from the infrared energy. And so in theory, in theory, if you if you put some water in the sun, um, it ought to it ought to build easy water. We've never never expressly done that experiment, mostly for logistical uh, reasons. Um, you know, in Seattle <clears throat> Especially um, in the winter time, we don't get much sun. If I look out right now, it's gray, and gray is typical, and that's why a lot of people um, they move to Seattle, and some of them don't make it. They they got to move away from Seattle. A good friend just just did that because of the gloom, um, and some people get depressed because of the gloom. So it's a little hard to go out, you know, and plan your experiment to go out in the sun when the sun is not so often there. Uh, so, so we haven't done exactly that experiment, but you know we really ought to. And you just re reminded me that in the summertime maybe we ought to do that. In right. theory, the sun should have a powerful effect, and that's also why sometimes um, when the sun does break through, people go outside. They feel good. Uh, you know, everybody thinks well, it's some deep psychological reason that we need to see more light and therefore we feel better it might be true but it also might be a direct effect of the sunlight we absorb the infrared wavelengths they build easy water and therefore our cells are functioning better and we feel better it might well be true 
Right, right. So it could be a variety of reasons, but it could be. Yeah. 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 Certainly uh, if, yeah go ahead. And I was going to say, certainly in effect, you know, moving, I, I'm did what, uh, what you're talking about moving from Seattle to Florida and for sure noticing, you know, just the first week I was here, just noticing, I mean, all the changes as far as my mood and just overall well being, you know, increasing a lot. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was just curious, you know, if that was to some degree due to, you know, an effect of, of easy water. It sounds like it's possible. It is absolutely possible. You know, I, I think, Toby, that um, many people um, seriously underestimate the importance um, of water in the body. If you if you read a typical book on cell biology or biochemistry, you'll find water in the index, but very few entries. Um, uh, to people who learn, uh, shall we say, conventional biochemistry, biophysics, um, uh, cell biology, water is nothing more than the background carrier of the more important molecules of life. It doesn't do anything. It's like a bathtub full of water, and you dump in the DNA and the proteins and everything works just fine. And Why do you think it's been overlooked like that? Uh, because, um, because of several debacles that took place in the science of water. Um, I, can, I can tell you about those. But first, I, I summarize. Uh, things seem to have gone wrong with several uh, experiments that were done by prominent people. And, and after that happened, a lot of scientists got scared of dipping their toe into the water, uh, so to speak. Um, and and uh, while well, water used to be a topic of scientific discussion, it ceased uh, to be that way in pretty much the last half of the previous century. Scientists were scared because if prominent scientists would apparently, parenthesis, screw up so badly, then um, scientists who are mere mortals daren't um, go into the studies of water because it's, it's, it could be treacherous. It could ruin your career. So people stayed away from it because people stayed away from it. Not much work was done after that. Um, people were aware of these debacles and they would, they would use it as um, um, oh, kind of scientific jokes. Oh, you're studying water, you know. <laughs> Good luck to you. See if your career is ruined. And because of that, uh, the research was stymied. Well, we have a conference we, I, that I organize each year. It's in Europe. Uh, last year was in Germany. It attracted 180 uh, uh, people. Uh, and, and there were multiple presentations about really interesting characteristics of water. Now that, in the late uh, um, 1900s or so, that didn't happen. There was almost nothing about about water, and 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 so when the when the textbooks are written, uh, you know, there's not not much to say. Were written, there's not was not much to say about water. The textbooks now um, uh, have not not caught on not yet, and and one of the reasons for that is the publishers of the textbooks uh, they they're inclined to uh, to have their have their books be profitable for the company. And if somebody wrote, writes a textbook, um, uh, presents a paradigm that differs grossly from the accepted paradigm, they're not gonna sell many books because the university will say, well, you know, we have to teach the standard stuff. We want our students to succeed. Uh, if they learn this kind of interesting, but a revolutionary type of, of understanding or paradigm, they won't pass the exams and our students will suffer and our university will suffer. And so we don't want to buy that book. And the publishers know that. So, so they're going to be reluctant to publish a book on biochemistry or cell biology that takes, a, you might say, revolutionary point of view. So it takes time. It takes a lot of time for this to happen. I'm sanguine that this will happen eventually, but it's not happening yet. Although a lot of people have become interested in easy water, or sometimes we call it the fourth phase of water. I'll tell you, in, um, I don't know how much time we have, but if you want, I can tell you a little bit about these two incidents that took place 
uh, about water. Um, you, okay, so. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, well, well, the first, the first one uh, that took place is with a Russian guy named Boris Deryagin. And, and Boris Deryagin was the premier physical chemist in all of Russia. This was in the 1960s uh, or so. And people respected him. Um, and Russia has many great physical chemists, but this was the top physical chemist in the whole country. And someone came to him with an observation, which he then took up and, and, and worked on for a few years. And, and he found that there was a kind of water that differed from ordinary water. Um, and um, um, it, it, it had a, a much lower uh, freezing point, hard to freeze, hard to vaporize, um, had a, a different, um, a different uh, kind of uh, absorption of light, or absorption spectra, different density. Everything about this kind of water seemed different. And, um, and he thought it was pure water because what he did was he took a glass capillary tube uh, and he put it into a device that where the water was evaporating and the water condensed in this capillary tube and it filled this glass capillary tube. And he began to see uh, uh, kinds of uh, streaks in the, uh, along the tube in the water. And that's what he had examined. And, and pretty soon um, in the West, it became fashionable or popular um, uh, to translate some of the work from Russian in, into English. And that happened, uh, if I believe, in, in the mid-1960s or so, because people in the West began to realize that the Russians were pretty good at, <laughs> at science. In fact, in my view, outstanding in, in science, very open-minded and clever. And so it came to being that the West became aware of Deryagin's finding of a different kind of water with different properties from ordinary water. And a lot of people thought this was exciting because you know, everybody thinks there are, just, there are three phases of water, solid, liquid, and vapor. And we think we understand the liquid water very well, but this guy was finding something that was different and seemingly revolutionary. So- uh, I'm, just, yeah, I'm just curious, I mean, you know, that's something that, you know, I, along with probably most people I'm assuming still today are taught, you know, the water has three phases. Is that something that, I mean, even though it's not true um, that you've proven that, is that something that it, it's still sort of not, uh, not an idea that's being accepted, at least in the Western world? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, yeah, yes and no. Um, so, um, there, there are various people, uh, uh, various chemists and physicists who have been critical of our work and, and what we found. Um, I, I don't agree with their criticism for you know, some very simple reasons, but um, uh, you'll find them on the internet. You'll find uh, um, some stuff about easy water, fourth phase water that, that's critical. Um, in some cases, I've actually responded formally in writing. In other cases, you know, I, uh, it's just so difficult to focus on, um, uh, on responding to everything that appears. And we spend most of our time doing experiments to create new, new knowledge. On the other hand, there are many, many people out there who, who have read my book, a Fourth Phase of Water, where all of this appears. Um, it, by the way, the, the, the book has become really popular and it's got high ratings on Amazon. And, um, Highly recommend it. Five, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, Fourth Phase of Water. It's been translated now into uh, multiple languages, even an audio book. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine how you could, you could uh, come forth with an audio book because the picture is really... So in other words, but I guess they give out some uh, printed document with the audio book, so it lets you look at the pictures while you're listening to it. I guess that seems to work. I've gotten some positive feedback on it. But of course, the print book is the nicest one. Anyway, um, where, where was I going? Yeah. Well, and so, I, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to ask, you know, speaking of, uh, speaking of experiments with the easy water, I was curious because when we met and talked before, um, you were telling me about 
um, you know, sort of some of the the experiments you were doing with, I believe it was the the brain octane oil and and butter or ghee yeah. Uh, yeah. with Dave Asprey. Yeah. Um, were those? Uh, did you guys finish those experiments or uh, any results from those? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and, and we submitted a paper for publication, and I'm hopeful that within the next week or two. Um, it, it, it's under serious re revision. We revise, we re revise, and it should be very close to, I think, to to acceptance. Uh, yeah, and we found that uh, next to next to ghee and um, next to various uh, other fats, uh, we find the very big easies uh, um, uh, more than we ever expected. They could be up to almost a millimeter in, in size. It was completely unexpected because because you you expect that um, typically that fats are not going to do anything and and uh, fats have been maligned for for many years as being uh, well not good for your health but in fact um, the, the uh, opinion has changed somewhat over the past few years and now people are beginning to recognize that fats um, just it as far as we were talking about sort of, you know, with fats and you yeah. know, that, that was one of the things was interesting. I mean, um, you know, following kind of Dave Asprey's work with Bulletproof and, and his popularization of Bulletproof coffee, um, you know, it's something that, you know, there's been various kind of claims that have been made about it, but now it's, it's cool that there's some hard kind of scientific data that, that can kind of explain um, how it works in part. Well, I believe I believe you're exactly right in, in that we we found um, huge exclusion zones, and it 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 goes along with the increase increasingly common belief that fats are good for you. So we think that that anything that builds easy is going to be good for you because that easy water is something that is absolutely critical to all function inside the body. And the evidence for that was presented in my 2001 book, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. Um, uh, so, so, so yeah, um, it, it kind of closes the loop a bit on the, on the value of fats, at least some, some fats. These are the fats um, with uh, um, medium chain fatty acids. Not all fats uh, will, will behave the same way, but, but these uh, do. Right. And so can you just, yeah. yeah, can you just explain a little more like what uh, what the experiment actually was and then how, how you were able to measure that increase in easy water? Yeah, sure. So, so the first thing is uh, to, to um, build a solid of some sort um, and uh, out of, say, ghee. Um, and so we took ghee and we uh, put it into some uh, cylindrical kind of uh, container and put it in the fridge low temperature. And when you release, you get a cylinder that's actually a solid um, when you take it out of the fridge. And it's a solid for some length of time. And then put this in water, uh, cold, cold water, with these particles, with these microspheres. And you look in the microscope, you don't even need a microscope, um, just um, look and you can see this microsphere free region building from the surface of the ghee into the water. And it builds and builds and builds over a period of five, 10 minutes, and it stops. Then you have a fully grown exclusion zone. And, um, and, and that, that's the way we do it. It's actually a pretty simple experiment, which is that you need the right apparatus to put together to make sure that it's, it's working properly. And we tried other various other fats, and we also found in, in many of them, uh, including lard, um, uh, and, and a few others that um, that we could actually we could actually um, that we could get exclusion zones um, uh, very nicely from a whole bunch of those. So Which yeah, fat, that's what. I was so, just sorry to interrupt you. I was just going to ask what uh, which fat was was able to generate the greatest exclusion zones. Ghee. Ghee. Yeah. Oh. And uh, as you know, the Ghee is considered um, in, by, in the Ayurvedic uh, culture and still a thing in India to be good for health. And so they use it all the time. Maybe that's why many of the Indians are as healthy as they are. <laughs> I'm not sure. At least the ones that have food to eat. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. 
And then you guys found so the same thing um, as far as the the MCT oil or uh, uh, one of the derivatives. I, I guess you guys were testing the specific the the C8 the the brain octane oil. We tried that too, and uh, that was that was a little more difficult to deal with because we couldn't uh, convert it into a solid uh, easily. But you know we could actually lay it on a surface, lay that oil on the surface. And above that sur surface, we could detect with the microscope, we could detect um, uh, an EZ, a uh, region that was microsphere free. So we could test that too, and that was, that was effective. Interesting. Yeah, so we're looking forward to the publication of the paper. The, as I said, the final one was uh, submitted a few days ago, and we're hopeful that everything will be okay. Yeah, yeah, no, when that comes out, please do uh, send me a link and I can put it in like the show notes. Um, oh, okay. So people can, sure. yeah, take a look at it. But yeah, that'll be really cool. Um, sure. I, I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, just from from your discussion of easy water and, and how kind of the lack of, of easy water um, can lead to, you know, a whole host of different kind of uh, dysfunctions and disease. Uh, it seems like, you know, mitochondrial function is something that has really, you know, kind of hit the, the, the mainstream, you know, over the last, you know, maybe five years or so, you know, as far as, you know, kind of uh, damaged mitochondria leading to a whole host of different disorders and um, ways to increase mitochondrial functioning, you know, being good for health overall. Is there any sort of link between the, the mitochondria and, and easy water production? I think there's a direct link between mitochondria and easy water production. I think mitochondria build easy water. Um, so if you look at the structure of the mitochondria, it's, it's got these uh, membranes that stick in, into that organelle. Um, and these membranes are exactly the kinds of structures next to which easy water builds. So given all the electrical aspects of the uh, mitochondria, um, the, the uh, electrical potential and such, and structure, we think that inside the mitochondria, easy water is built. And, um, and that easy water can either contribute to the easy water inside the cell or the charge in that easy, the negative charge could permeate, that's easier to do, permeate the mitochondria and go into the cell. And we know that negative charge builds easy water. So what I'm getting to in this sort of complicated statement is to say that some of the energy of the cell um, comes from the electrical potential of easy water. And the mitochondria might actually produce easy water to help, um, help construct the necessary easy water inside the rest of the cell. Interesting. So this is a, a theory at this point is are is there research or is there research being done to to see if that if the mitochondria are actually or if easy water is actually being generated by the mitochondria well you know we've been thinking about that we haven't done any we're trying to think of um how to test that it, ah. it is not it's not so obvious uh how to do it but um uh if you have any good idea we'll we'd like to hear from you you know, to, to see that there's easy water inside the mitochondria. And um, um, it's not so obvious how to test that. We can do it in indirect ways, but we'd like something that's more direct. It seems designed, so to speak, just to create that uh, sort of buildup of easy water. And you know, um, it, it might be, uh, Toby, that that uh, much of the energy from the cell is actually coming from easy water. Um, so we all we all think we all think that um, the energy comes from the splitting of ATP, a high energy bond, and that that's certainly possible, um, maybe even likely. However, let me give you a caveat on that. Um, um, so. That's an old idea. I think about 70 or 80 years old that energy comes from the high energy bond. Um, and everybody's accepted it, uh, just about maybe more than any other feature of all science. Uh, everybody knows that the energy comes from ATP splitting. However, one year after 
uh, the paper on that that revealed a high energy bond one one year after it came out um, another paper came out um, from by a physical chemist said these guys screwed up because they made an arithmetic error they didn't use the right number in a certain place and in fact there is no high energy bond in ATP um, nobody according to Gilbert Ling um, uh, who is probably the, the guy most responsible for the idea that the water inside the cell is structured or ordered in some way. Uh, a hero of mine, now 100 years old, just this year, 100. Uh, he mentions this not only in his books, but also his website, which is gilbertling.org. Um, easy to get to. And, and he'll cite the references and tell you that it's not so clear that the evidence that uh, uh, that we use ATP to gain all or even maybe some of our energy that, that is necessarily correct. Um, so I don't know the answer. I don't know who's right, who's wrong. Uh, one has to delve in very deeply, um, the original paper and the one that came after that, to make judgment as to who's right and who's not right. Um, but the odd thing is that except for Gilbert Ling, nobody has ever to his knowledge and to my knowledge, commented on, um, uh, on that paper that came out challenging that point of view. So now it's in every textbook and you know, once it's in textbooks for two or three generations, it's fact. So another possibility is that some or much, I hesitate to say all, but um, uh, much of the energy is actually coming from the battery that I mentioned earlier that the fact that you've in inside the cell that you um, have a lot of negative charge in fact let me say parenthetically people who study cell biology know that that the reason the reason the inside of the cell is negatively charged compared to the outside by 50 to 100 millivolts has to do with pumps and channels in the membrane I, I think that's wrong. I wrote a paper on that, which uh, appeared three or four years ago in, in the literature. And uh, maybe it's too much to go into now because maybe it's too much of a, a detail. But another possibility to explain why when people stick electrodes into cells, they get negative electrical potential is because the EZ water has negative charge. So if you fill the cell with stuff that has negative charge and you stick an electrode in, you're going to be measuring negative charge. It's a very simple kind of uh, explanation. Uh, and, and, and therefore, it's possible that this negative charge, this represents potential energy because all those negative charges would like to get away from each other as much as possible because they repel, but they can't because you've got a cell membrane and such. So the um, question is um, whether whether really uh, um, it's these pumps and channels in the membrane or, um, um, and one of Gilbert Ling's arguments against the, these membrane pumps is they require far too much energy. The cell can't possibly have enough energy to, uh, to power these pumps. And when he came to that conclusion about 40 years ago, there was only one pump that was known. And now there are many pumps or transporters they all need energy because pumps require energy. And he found experimentally it was impossible. So, hmm. so, and the other observation or another observation is you can take a gel, no membrane, but it exhibits the same features, negative electrical potential. You stick the same electrode in the gel without a membrane as you stick in the cell with a membrane and you get the same electrical potential. So if it's really true that the electrical potential inside the cell comes from the membrane, but you got something else without the membrane that gives you the same result, it's hard to maintain that it's the membrane that does it. I, right. I just meant this as a parenthetical um, argument, but, but Gilbert Ling is definitely worth reading. Uh, some of his stuff is a little hard to penetrate, but um, he has come up with a lot of ideas that I believe are, are sound. But so I'm, I'm circumventing the question a little bit about energy. It's possible that all of the energy, sorry, I would hesitate to say all, most of the energy, some of the energy 
we don't know how much comes from this battery from from this condensation of charge charges want to get away from each other they have potential energy and and that's the energy that leads to the folding of proteins which is really the work of the cell when the protein goes from from this state to, to this state it folds and and the action the cell goes into action when it goes into action this is what causes the action um, the the folding of the protein so in a muscle cell for example actin and myosin proteins would fold and that would build up tension and cause a contraction um, in a nerve cell uh, folding of proteins in one way or another is responsible for the transmission of information uh, in a secret secretory cell um, folding of protein uh, is responsible for the secretion that occurs at the in, in the cell. So, but this folding of protein, the normal state is that surrounding this protein is a lot of easy water. The cell is packed with it. But if you don't have enough easy water, then the cell is in a strange environment. And instead of folding, it misfolds or doesn't fold or stays folded or something like this. And therefore you have a pathology. Your muscle isn't working well, the nerve is not doing what it should be doing, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the energy <laughs> for this protein folding could come from this concentration of negative charge that sits there and wants to become neutral if it can. That's what's responsible, at least in part, for the powering of the cell and for our body. I okay. Believe. And what specifically can you tell me about brain cells, neurons, and easy water? Has there been any uh, work as far as looking at different psychiatric or neurological disorders and how easy water is, is interacting with those or? Uh, n none that I can think of offhand, but um, um, a whole bunch of, of neurologists and neurophysiologists are beginning to, uh, to look at that possibility. Because, you know, the brain, uh, of course, full of nerves, but it's full of full of water. I think the brain is, what is 70 or 80 percent water, more than more than most other organs is filled with water. And from our experiments, uh, we can project that almost all of that water will be easy water. Um, and and so if, you, if chronically, if you don't have enough in some of your cells, you'd be having issues. Um, um, you would be having headaches or other neurological um, Im impairments. So uh, this is right now only speculation, but I'm, I'm convinced that something is, that there's going to be a, a, a profound linkage between water and brain activities. In fact, there are some people who, um, your, your viewers may seem far out, but we're thinking that, that the water itself inside your brain is actually a repository for information. And I don't know if you yourself have have gotten into the the idea of information storage in water. Have, have you ever heard about that? Or not too much. No. No. Well, this is now getting to be a big deal. So a lot of people are getting interested in that um, uh, in the possibility that water could store information. Um, so experimentally, people have been demonstrating uh, this, and you know, in the in the conferences that we organize every year, I mentioned last year in Germany, um, and probably in Germany this coming year or Italy. Um, usually, there are three or four presentations that demonstrate, in one way or another, that the water can store information, and and we have. We have uh, experiments that are beginning to show that as well. So uh, what I mean to say is that lots of people are getting interested in the subject because it's a kind of frontier subject that people couldn't imagine possible. But now with easy water, it seems possible because easy water is the molecules are organized in a regular three-dimensional array, just like computer memory um, and, and we know that the oxygen molecules in that array have different possible states. So in a normal computer memory, there are two states equivalent to a zero and a one. Um, 
In this case, the oxygens actually have five different um, so-called oxidation states. Uh, typically, uh, is minus two, and then there's minus one, and zero, even plus one and plus two. So in theory, every or any one of the oxygen molecules in that three-dimensional array of easy water could take on up to five different states. And if you do the calculation, um, if, if, if that's really true, um, you can calculate that the advantage in this kind of memory over standard computer memory is like six or seven or eight orders of magnitude. It's huge, huge difference. In other words, the water that, in th at least in theory, the water that's in inside our brain or inside any cell has the capacity, a huge capacity for information storage. And then the logical question is, well, gee, that's fine, but where, where is the um, evidence for this? Well, I'll just give you one piece of evidence. And, um, there's a, a guy in Germany who, who is um, studying, um, uh, his name is Kernbach, uh, and, and he's studying uh, water. You put, a, put, put some water, it, he's done the experiment of putting water on his laboratory bench and then asking people from some distance to focus their intention on the water. Um, and after they do, um, even from as far as 10,000 kilometers away, 10,000 kilometers, his lab is in Germany, and I think it was New Zealand. Uh, um, and, um, and at an appointed time, and the guy focused his, his intention on the water from 10,000 miles away, and he shows that about the technique that he uses to measure the physical properties of water changes dramatically um, wow. about 30 minutes. And I think he's published a paper. I haven't, haven't seen it yet, but he's been presenting at our, our conference. And then um, an even more famous uh, experiment by Luc Montagnier. He won the Nobel Prize. He comes to our conference every year, or has been coming. I hope he keeps coming. And he demonstrated uh, uh, something really remarkable about, about water memory. He got his Nobel Prize discovering HIV, but then he changed fields. And um, um, after the late Jacques Benveniste um, died, he was actually probably the first one to talk about water memory. Um, um, uh, Luc Montagnier began to continue the, his kinds of experiments. And, and what he showed is, just absolutely remarkable. Um, so I'll, I'll just tell you briefly, he takes two containers sealed, he puts them next to each other. In one container, there's DNA, a short strand of DNA. And the next container sitting next to it is water. And just these two sitting right next to each other, perfectly sealed so there can be no chemical communication. He adds a little bit of energy like 60 hertz or 50 hertz or something like that to give the system energy. Then after a, a day, these two have been sitting next to e each other, he hypothesizes that the DNA is, is radiating information that's absorbed by the water. See, so then he tests this, he throws away the DNA. He takes, tests this by taking the water and using it to build new DNA using a reaction called PCR, maybe you know or don't know about it. it. Yeah, it amplifies DNA. So you take the water and you mix it with, with, with the chemicals and you get new DNA. And that new, the sequence of that new DNA matches the sequence of the DNA that had been sitting near the water. Huh. Remarkable. Absolutely. And, and according to Luke, it's been confirmed by several other, I think, Italian uh, groups. So this is totally remarkable. You know, if if it's true, and you know, we're led to believe that it's true, right? It's, Especially uh, coming yeah. from a guy who's won the the Nobel Prize, certainly. Yeah, has you'd expect that. To say, you yeah. know, he has some credibility. Of course, yeah. of course, it's very controversial, as you uh, as you might guess, because you know, there's a tendency for scientists, um, in in theory, open-minded scientists, for scientists to um, 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 reject what they don't understand. So if someone says that that water can store information, you, you know, you get a blank f face. They don't want to hear anything more about evidence because um, it's, it's, um, 
it's impossible, therefore I don't even want to listen to what you have to say. Uh, however, there's evidence that is beginning to pile up that all points to the possibility that information could be stored in the water. And, and I'll go way out on a limb on this one. You know, our brains are filled with water. Mm -hmm. And if the water can store information, then it's possible that uh, some of the information that's stored in our brain is actually stored in the water in the brain. If you think about, uh, if you think about how much information is stored in our brain, um, and according to some people beyond our brain, like someone like Rupert Sheldrake, who, who says that um, the mind is bigger than the brain, there's information all out there. Um, and, you know, he has reasonable evidence for, for, for that. It's hard to understand, um, even for him to figure out what's going on, but it, it, it may be there. And so, so it's possible, um, if you think of the information that you have in your brain, Imagine all the images that you have stored, and you know how much space that takes up in your digital computer. And if the information unit is one cell, or one neuron, um, the, the, that places huge limits on the amount of information that you could be stored. But if the limiting factor is the size of the water molecule, you know, you have a gazillion water molecules inside of each nerve cell, then you have a huge capacity, much larger capacity, and and going way out on a limb and talking again about coming back to Rupert Sheldrake, um, if if the information that's stored can be radiated out, just as Luc Montagnier has shown, then um, there could be a possible basis for information even outside our brain to somehow communicate with what's inside of our brain. So all of this, all of this is highly speculative. On the other hand, you know, science is no fun without some kinds of speculation. Just merely crossing the T's and dotting the I's will get you perhaps incrementally ahead, but we need revolutions. <laughs> and, mm. and some of this stuff is revolutionary. It may turn out to be dead wrong, but if it's right, it's really interesting. Yeah, it should be fascinating to see what the what the research ends up bearing out. Totally. Um, yeah, totally. So, and just just to kind of flesh out this idea of the uh, kind of water storing information, is this so? Could this be sort of you know any sort of memory? You know, whether that be you know a, a, a past memory or dream or uh, emotion? Is this is that kind of the idea that anything? kind of related to, to brain function could be sort of stored in the water? Could be, it could be. And, you know, emotional traumas, uh, something you've uh -huh. suffered from at an early age could be firmly embedded and not so easy to get out. So, Interesting. Yeah, that, could... that is possible. Uh, there's so many ramifications um, and you can speculate about them, but the, the goal now is to try to figure out uh, about the nature of water memory. We know it exists because people have done experiments. We've, we've all also done experiments. These are preliminary experiments, uh, but they're very simple. We, we take a container of water and put it on the laboratory bench, and we have people put their hands around it and focus a positive intention on the water for five or 10 minutes. And then we measure the water uh, before and after. And so far, consistently, uh, we have only five or six subjects, but consistently there's a shift in 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 the um, uh, this is a, a technique it's called UV vis spectroscopy. It measures the absorption of light at different wavelengths in the UV invisible range and there's a definite shift that occurs before and after versus after um, the intention has been applied to the water it's preliminary i got a I have to emphasize that we, we haven't done yet all the proper controls, but we're working on that right now. So I'm curious, have you read uh, The Biology of Belief? I believe Bruce Lipton. No, I've been wanting to uh, to do that, but... Um, that yeah. That's the first thing that came to my mind when, when you're talking about the, these sort of experiments that seem like, I mean, before I read that book, I would, wouldn't believe you. I mean, it, it sounds so outlandish, but in that book, it's like talking about similar things. So it makes sense that, you know, there might be oh, something yeah. to this. And, that, 
and that's the why why somebody who's uh, local on I think it was Bainbridge Island invited me to meet Bruce Lipman. We've never never met, but I I know about his work, and I think he may know about our work. But I was in Japan at the time, so so it's failed. But but um, I I know that uh, his his work is impactful, um, and thank you for <laughs> leading me in that direction. Yeah, so, and I. If I remember correctly, it's been several years since I, I read the book, but I think like the main thing it was measuring was was heart rate variability and how that can sort of fluctuate based on you know the intention that that people are giving it. So that's another kind of interesting uh, research thing down the road is whether kind of heart rate variability changes the the yeah. complexion of easy water or or vice versa too. Or yeah, as a reflection of some facet of easy easy water. Right. Um, I give you another example that was kind of kind of amusing. Um, it has to do with a three star Michelin chef, who I had the good fortune of meeting. His name is Heston Blumenthal, and uh, he runs a restaurant uh, called the Fat Duck uh, in near London, and it was. It was voted by whom I'm, I'm not sure best restaurant in the world. So this is so we had um, I, I met him at his home. He now lives in the south of France. I went with my late uh, wife and and um, and we spent a full day there overnight. Slept over and we became friends. And I met him again. Uh, I met him again a, a couple of months ago at our water conference. And he couldn't wait to tell me his idea. <laughs> and his idea was to organize a symposium together. He'll invite uh, six of the best chefs in the world, and I'll invite scientists dealing with water, and the topic will be the role of water in food and cooking. So wow. this is very exciting. Be but meanwhile, yeah, so we, we had this meeting over, it was very nice, over a dinner a local at a local restaurant. I figured he'd choose the best one. It was, it was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> everybody recognized him, you know, chefs, especially three-star Michelin chefs are celebrities in Europe here, m m much, much less so. But um, so he, he poured some wine and he said to me, he said, well, before you drink it, he said, um, I, I want you to spend one minute thinking of the person you absolutely hate. You just can't stand to be in the same room with that person, right? And, and focus your, your intention on that person. So I did that. Um, I, I could think of not too many people, but I thought of one who, who I found somewhat distasteful. And then taste the wine. So I tasted the wine. And now I want you to think about a person you absolutely love, you'd like to have right next to you all the time, and as uh, a wonderful person. I did that too, and then drink it. And the, the tastes were distinctly different, uh, clearly different. And I think the point that he was making is uh, uh, this is not water, but wine, of course, does contain water um, in addition to the alcohol. Um, and, and by the way, also, we found that ethyl alcohol shares many of the same properties as water. That's an interesting mm. sideline. It's in my, my um, fourth phase book, the one I mentioned earlier. But at any rate, um, um, you know, there are lots of things that we, we never really give a whole lot of thought to. And the fact that, that the wine tastes different, <laughs> depending on what you're thinking, is really a revelation. Um, uh, and, and it kind of demonstrates that, that um, what, what you're thinking, what you're feeling has a big impact on your life, on many aspects of your life. And also, you know, it impacts their cooking because if the chefs in that restaurant have negative feelings about stuff, it could be reflected in the food, you see, because the food's got water. And if the negative information comes in the water, it's possible, again, this is wild speculation, it's possible that, that the food will take on a flavor that's not as ideal as if love went into the preparation. So, you know, when your grandmother prepares something, uh, with a lot of love for you, the grandchild, um, it makes a difference uh, compared to, for example, when you get it at a restaurant where the chef couldn't care less. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of that has such interesting implication. Um, there, there's so much that 
if if this is all true, what I've been telling you about, if this is all true, and it, 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 it's a, one of the most important revolutions in science. Because water's all over the place, and we think of it as kind of inert, but it may not be inert at all. Right. Yeah, this has been a fascinating discussion. Um, yeah, and I, I, I so look forward to seeing, you know, what the, the future of, of this research and, and your lab's research brings. Um, you know, maybe before we wrap up, I'm curious if you could give me, say, your top three, how about top three recommendations of, of the best ways to boost uh, your easy water production? To um, produce, based well, on boost production of easy water? Or to increase, just to increase, yeah, the, the easy water um, in your the, cells. The amount of easy water? The amount, water? yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I know we already touched on, uh, on saunas and fat a bit. Um, what, anything else, though, that yes, makes yeah, a big difference? Yeah, there, there, there are a few. Um, okay. So, um, okay, one of them is connecting yourself to the earth. Now, why, why should that help? By I mean connecting yourself to the earth, I mean electrically. So it means walking barefoot on the beach or connecting yourself electrically uh, to a, a metal plate that's connected to a metal rod that's driven deeply into the earth. So you're electrically connected to the earth. It's been known for some years, there's a lot of research on it. It's, call, it's called um, earthing or grounding, depending on where you come from. I started in electrical engineering, so we refer to it as grounding, but most people refer to it as earthing. You'll find it all over the internet. There have been, or all over journals too, been a lot of studies, uh, biophysical studies, and the studies document that this stuff is good for health, and nobody is, there are some theories, but uh, nobody has really understood why. I think I understand why, and I think it has to do with easy water building easy water, which is the question that you asked. And, um, and uh, why do I think so? Because the earth is negatively charged. I don't know if you're aware of this. I was not aware until about a decade ago when a, a Russian colleague, as he was about to leave for home in Russia, was telling me about the earth's electric field. And I said, Andre, you must be talking about the magnetic field. He said, no, I'm talking about the electric field. I said, I never heard of an electric field, and I was educated in electrical engineering, and somebody would have told me if there's an electric field on the Earth. So, um, so he said, well, it looks as, as though your educational system is deficient because of Russia. Everybody knows about, uh, even middle school students know about the Earth's electric field. Um, that is, the Earth is negative, and somewhere up there, perhaps the ionosphere is positive. So it's like a capacitor with negative charge in the earth, on the earth, and positive charge up there. And that gives rise to an electric field that's perpendicular to the surface of the earth. And it's pretty strong, uh, 100 volts per meter uh, at the surface of the earth. So it means if you, if you, the potential difference between your nose and your toes is about 200 volts if you're standing up. So it's pretty significant. So I still didn't believe it. Uh, well, there's the next day, one of my students hands me Feynman's lectures. This is Richard Feynman, the Nobel physicist from the last, he was, uh, many considered him to be the Einstein of the second half of the last century. And, and his books, um, his three volume set of lectures that he gave at Caltech were reproduced. And one of my students comes to me and opens volume two, chapter nine, and there it is, a whole chapter on the Earth's electric field and on the negative charge of the Earth. And in this chapter, he presents all the evidence that um, is really old evidence, but it's pretty clear the Earth is negatively charged, it's not neutral. So it means if you connect yourself to the negative Earth, it means you're connecting yourself to a almost infinite supply of electrons of negative charges and if you're deficient in negative charge, negatively charged easy water, when these electrons seep into your body, um, we know from experiments that if you add electrons to water, it builds easy. See, and so what these electrons are doing are presumably the same thing. They come from the earth. There's an almost infinite supply, and they 
uh, seep their way into your body and they build easy water. So I think the reasons, um, the reasons for improved health uh, in the process of earthing has to do with electrons coming from the earth into your body, building easy water, making you feel better. So that's one. Um, uh, another one is um, eating the right substances. It's been known for thousands of years um, that certain foods, certain herbs, spices are good for health. Oh, an example is turmeric, curcumin. Um, people have known from Ayurvedic times that this is good for health and it's good for many, many different aspects of health. And so it's not, I've got a headache, I'll take some turmeric. It's, you know, I have an ache, I'm a headache and I've got a pain in this muscle or whatever. And this seems to work um, uh, against many afflictions that you have. And so you might think at first that, well, you know, maybe, maybe turmeric is something special. And, um, it works on a multitude of different receptors inside your body that take up the turmeric and, and do something positive. Or another hypothesis is it has one action and that action is felt everywhere. And so we hypothesize that that action is on water. Um, if turmeric were to build easy water, um, you take turmeric, easy water should build in your body, and therefore you feel better, whatever the affliction might be. So we did experiments to test that. We tested and we got positive results. Um, uh, small amounts of turmeric, um, uh, similar to what you might, concentrations you might find in the body, uh, build easy water. And we tested, um, right now seven or eight different substances that are known to be good for health and uh, they all build easy water and whereas we tested um, glyphosate which is um, inimical to good health at least certainly of weeds and and many people argue us as well all it does is diminish the size of easy water so yeah you asked me for other things besides sauna um, uh, and sunshine, and, and those are, are two things that I think of off, offhand. Um, the earthing is one, and, and certain herbs and substances that have been known for a long time uh, to be good for health, and our evidence shows that it might be due to the buildup of easy water. Interesting. Does that answer? Yes, yeah. No, I mean, it, it, I was just thinking. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just thinking it's, it's so interesting because you know, something like, like turmeric, you're, you know, mentioning that it's like, it's been used for so long and, and people have kind of known about the benefits, but we're st like, we're, you know, we're coming at it from so many different angles now trying to, you know, or, you know, showing that it decreases inflammation or does this and that. And, and it's just, you know, I, I think very interesting that um, easy water is, is just one of the, you know, number of things and maybe one of the least recognized at least at this point um you know uh effect uh things that you know is one of the ways in which these these substances or practices has you know huge effects on human health i i yeah i i mean i think uh, at least hypothetically the the mechanism could lie in the buildup of easy water there, there may be other mechanisms also but our evidence seems pretty clear Sure. It's yeah. exciting, you know, because uh, how does this stuff work? Is it magic or is it something else? Well, no, I think it's not magic at all. Right. I think we've we've done a good job of of explaining that. You've done a good job of. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so great. So, if uh, if people want to find out more about your work or uh, get in touch with your lab, does uh, any resources that you would point people to? Well, yeah, you can go to our lab website. It's got a lot of stuff on it, and uh, it's a, a long URL. I don't remember it uh, offhand, but we can post you a link do to a it. Google search under my name, University of Washington, Gerald H. Pollock, University of Washington, Bioengineering. Any of those will get you to the to the website, and of course. Um, I think the best place is is, is the latest book. Um, it's called The Fourth Phase of Water. And it's, um, you know, on, on on Amazon, it's got a lot of nice reviews and um, uh, it's become really popular. So if your language is not e English, it, you'll find it under 
bunch of other languages, but but um, I, I recommend it. it. It it's actually pretty cheap, also um, because we we wanted to keep the price low in in order that the information get disseminated. And so I, I recommend that because um, because it it's read it tells the story or lots of stories um, and got some humor in it, some cartoons, um, and it's designed to be readable uh, for the non-expert. So, and the reviews talk about that also, that it's really accessible. So a lot of people have fed back positive comments, a few negative ones too, but uh, you know how it goes. So it goes, yeah. So I recommend that. Um, so the lab website and, and um, uh, Amazon, the fourth phase of water. Awesome. Awesome. Well, if you guys uh, want to get in touch uh, or leave a review, um, please do so. Um, YouTube, we're Roscoe's Wetsuit. Um, Instagram, Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. You can also find the audio versions of the podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So whatever format that you would like, go check us out. Um, Dr. Pollack, thanks so much again for coming on the show. Well, you know, thank you so much, Toby. I really appreciate it. And um, we'll see you again one of these days. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah thanks thanks, thanks for inviting me. Okay. Yes, take care. Absolutely. Okay. You too.